In the previous video, we talked about purine metabolism, uric acid, and hyperuricemia. And we mentioned that hyperuricemia is really just elevated levels of serum uric acid, and that normally in the blood, uric acid ranges between 3.5 and 7.2 milligrams per deciliter. So having a value of uric acid in the blood above that 7.2 would qualify somebody as having hyperuricemia. Now hyperuricemia really just refers to the state of the blood of having more uric acid. Gout, or gouty arthritis on the other hand, is the pathological manifestation that can happen with hyperuricemia. So we're gonna talk about that in this video. What is the pathophysiology of gout? So when the production of uric acid exceeds the capacity to eliminate that uric acid, molecules of uric acid tend to aggregate together and they crystallize or they form crystals. And so over here, you see a molecule of uric acid. So let's suppose we're in a state of hyperuricemia and for whatever reason, we're actually making more uric acid than we're able to eliminate. So that's a positive balance. And we're gonna start building up more and more molecules of uric acid. Now, you got molecules of uric acid floating around, and there's a tendency for them to stick together. So maybe this uric acid molecule is floating by another one close enough to where they kind of just stick together. So now you've got a very small aggregate of two uric acid molecules. Now they're floating by another molecule of uric acid, and it sticks to that cluster. Now you have an aggregate of three molecules of uric acid. This aggregate's gonna grow larger, and larger and larger, and eventually it's going to form a crystal. These are actually what crystals of uric acid look like under a microscope. They look like sharp shards of glass. Very painful looking. Now these uric acid crystals are water insoluble, meaning they don't dissolve in water. So as they grow larger and larger, they tend to sink in the body due to gravity, and they descend to the lowest possible regions of the body. That being said, the most common place to find gout, where these crystals eventually nest, is in the big toe, in the hallux around the first MTP joint. The first toe is eventually affected in about 90% of people with gout. That is by far the most common place to find gout. But you can also find it in the ankle, you can find it on the fifth digit side of the foot, you can find it in the knee, and you can also find it in the elbow. It's a lot less common in the fingers, in the wrist, and in the shoulder. And here's what's literally happening. You're getting these uric acid crystals that are depositing within the joint itself. This is specifically the first MTP joint. And you saw what those gouty crystals look like. They look like shards of glass. So you can imagine this is extremely painful. In fact, it's rated as the most painful form of arthritis because you literally have shards of glass, I guess not literally, but things that are shaped like shards of glass cutting around inside the joint. And this causes inflammation. So speaking of inflammation, let's talk about the diagnosis of gout. So first of all, you have a physical exam. What do you expect to find in the physical exam? Well, here's two feet right here. The one on the right is normal. The one on the left, this is the one affected by gouty arthritis. So it won't necessarily affect the whole foot like you see here. Sometimes it's just local and isolated, maybe in that MTP joint. But again, you're gonna have inflammation. Inflammation is associated with pain, redness, warmth, swelling. You're gonna see all of those all over this foot. This is a pretty severe case of gout. The person's also gonna have diminished toe flexion and extension, passive range of motion and active range of motion. A lot of that limitation in range of motion is simply due to the swelling. There's thing taking up space in the joint. It limits the range of motion. The person will also likely have an antalgic gait because weight bearing on that foot is gonna be extremely painful. And so the person's gonna favor the use of their other foot, so it'll be an antalgic gait. And then of course, diminish weight bearing on the affected lower extremity. That's what you would find in a physical exam, but you can also look at serum uric acid levels. Again, if you take a blood test and the uric acid is pretty far above 7.2, that's what you would expect to find in a person with gout. But they can also take a little biopsy, a little sample, and then look under a microscope and see if you have those crystals that we saw on the previous slide. I actually developed gout fairly recently on vacation of all times in my right foot. And this picture doesn't really do it justice, but you can hopefully see that my right foot is a little bit redder 
than the left foot. And you can't really see it too well in this picture here, but the right side was considerably more swollen than the left. And if you look at my range of motion, left side, pretty darn good. Right side, very limited, especially on the first digit side because of the swelling, especially in that first MTP region. So what are the treatments for gout? Well, there's several. Number one is obvious, it's lifestyle changes. So if you go back and look at the risk factors for developing hyperuricemia, and therefore gout, you'll see some of these addressed on there. Diet. Gout is in part caused by eating too much purines. So reducing your alcohol intake, reducing your intake of purine-rich foods, which would be organ meats, gamey meats, sometimes red meat and seafood. Making sure that you stay hydrated and even reducing your BMI doesn't hurt. Modalities for pain management, ice, heat. You definitely don't want to use heat if you're in the acute stage of gout because it's already going to be hot due to the inflammation. So you're much better off with ice. Most people are going to prefer ice when they're having an acute flare-up. Now in terms of medications, it depends on what stage of the gout you're in. If you're having an acute flare-up, you're probably going to be prescribed prednisone or NSAIDs. And prednisone is a corticosteroid, so that's going to help reduce inflammation, and it works wonders on gout in terms of reducing the pain. Um, later on, you might be prescribed an NSAID, a very strong one, like endomethacin. Endomethacin is usually good for lots of types of arthritis, like gouty arthritis, so gout osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and even ankylosing spondylitis. But some of these drugs down here, like allopurinol, and I also haven't written colchicine on there, those are more prophylactic drugs. You would not take those during an acute flare-up because those can actually make the gout worse. Drugs like allopurinol, you would actually take in between flare-ups if you're suffering from chronic gout, but never during an acute flare-up. We'll talk more about allopurinol in the next video. We'll be looking at its mechanism of action. So hopefully this video gave you some good information on hyperuricemia and gout. Join us in the next video when we talk about the mechanism of action of allopurinol. Thank you. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.